Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, I guess you've all had your cup of coffee and whatever, and we're ready to go for another half hour. And for those of you joining us on television, again, we just like to thank you. We just can't get over how you support us financially. And uh, your letters, my, what an encouragement uh, to, uh, to read your letters. Uh, one yesterday just stood out, and uh, so typical how that our program and our teaching had just transformed their whole household. Well, what else can you expect uh, but to let the Word do its work? And so we appreciate those kind of letters and your prayers. And again, as I said in the last program, we appreciate those of you who come in for these tapings. We know some of you drive quite a distance. Now, today we've uh, got a special treat. We've got our youngest son and his little wife, Kim. Many of you, especially up in the Minnesota area, meet them periodically. But they're down from Duluth, from 30 below zero weather, and uh, in warm and sunny Oklahoma. And uh, we're just glad to have Todd and Kim with us. They left the other four kids back home with Greg and Jeanette, so they're just here with the one today. Okay, now we're back in uh, book 63, and Iris always likes to have me announce that, because when we answer the phone, it's kind of nice if you can just say, I'm ready for such and such a book or program in book number 63. All right, now we're going to pick right up where we left off. I di kind of digress more than I intended to last program. And we only got one or two verses, so we're going to jump back in again at verse 8 of Isaiah 63. But I want to remind you, the whole half hour that we just spent was to show that God always keeps a remnant. Even in ancient Israel, the whole nation certainly were not obedient believers. The vast majority were anything but. And if you doubt me, go back and read your Old Testament. But in the midst of them, they still had that remnant of true believers, and so it is today. Just because the church is full and seemingly vibrant and is making a lot of headway numbers-wise, that doesn't mean that they're all believers. Because, uh, you know, I've given the illustration years back when we were in Genesis. I ordered a book from... Uh, one of the Lutheran seminaries, and it was written by a Lutheran theologian, and it was just simply called The Flood. And I've never gotten over the analogy he drew. And I've repeated it before, I'm going to repeat it again, because this is so typical, I think, of what we're seeing, especially today, with these huge megachurches full of a lot of excitement, seemingly, but how much the truth of the word. But anyhow, he said this, that when Noah and those three sons were building that humongous ark, which, remember, was longer than a football field, that was, what, three, four stories high. Stands to reason. They probably had to hire extra help. But, he said, when the flood came, were any of those extra workers in the ark? No, they had no concern, even though they'd helped build it. And then he took it one step further. And this is sobering. He said, how many church people are busy, 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 singing in the choir, teaching Sunday school, giving, doing every which thing, but they're not in the ark? And, you know, that's frightening. They have all the churchianity in the world, but they have no saving grace. And so this is why we try to just constantly emphasize it isn't the work that you do, it's the faith that you have in what Christ has already done. All right, now, same way in Israel. There was that small element that were true believers, not just worshipers. All right, jump in at verse 8 now. Remember, this is the, the element that we're dealing with, this little remnant of believers, but we're picturing them in the closing days of the age or in the final days of the tribulation because this is what we're really referring to over and over throughout these final chapters. Verse 8, For he said, that is the Lord, Surely they, this remnant, are my people. Now, you remember what the verses said in our last program? And when Romans chapter 11 especially, what would God say? They are my people. Now, he doesn't say that concerning Israel today. They're out there in unbelief. And although he's certainly in control, he's got them where he wants them, yet they are not a nation of believers. They are not what God will yet call my people. All right, now read it on. For, um, 
For he said, Surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their what? Savior. They were true believers. And so even back in the Old Testament economy, where salvation is far different than what you and I understand, yet he was their Savior. Next verse, in all their affliction. Now Israel has always gone through a constant time of persecution and affliction. But in all their affliction, he was afflicted. That is, he suffered with them. In fact, you remember, I think I mentioned in our last taping, which was shortly after the tsunamis over there in Asia, that God does not precipitate these tragic events. Satan does. God permits it, but Satan is the one who moves and shakes these things. But why does Satan bring so much turmoil and suffering on the human race when he's already got them under his control? Because Satan knows it hurts the heart of God. God doesn't enjoy seeing those thousands being washed away. It tears at his heart, even in their unbelief. And so this is what it's saying here. As Israel was suffering affliction, who was suffering with him? God was. And he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he what? He redeemed them. Now you want to remember the whole book of Exodus is really a picture of what? Redemption. And redemption is buying something back that you have previously owned. Well, I haven't got time to go into all the ramifications, but nevertheless, when the brothers sold Joseph down into Egypt, it was the sin that broke the fellowship between him and the brothers. And so the whole process had to begin then of redemption. And that, of course, was bringing them back out of Egypt four or 200 and some years later. All right, but now then, he was their Redeemer, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. In other words, up through their ancient history, the days of antiquity. Verse 10, but instead of all, in spite of all of his love and grace, they what? They rebelled in unbelief. They didn't want to be collared by godliness and spirituality. They wanted to live the life of the flesh. And they vexed his Holy Spirit, Therefore, he was turned to be their, what? Enemy. And consequently, again, he used Babylon, and he used the Syrians, and he used other nations to be their tormentors. All right, and he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. Verse 11, but even while he's chastising the nation because of their unbelief, what does he remember? The days of Moses. And he said, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him, that led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name? Now, every time I consider the parting of the Red Sea by Moses and the children of Israel walking over on dry ground, I just have to mull to myself, how many of the current world's population believe that really happened? Well, I don't know, but I got a pretty good idea. Not many. I think in the minds of most people, that's just another legend. That's another myth that was concocted around the campfire. But it happened. And it is something that takes some faith. Yes, the water of the Red Sea parted. And now I have one favorite portion of Scripture to prove that. Turn back with me to Joshua. And if there's any in my listening audience that may be of that persuasion, that this is just Jewish legend, that these things didn't really happen. Yes, they did. Physically. Physically, the waters of the Red Sea were parted, and Israel walked through on dry ground. Come back with me to uh, Joshua. I think I want chapter... Two or three. Chapter two. And the spies have now confronted Rahab on the wall of Jericho. Verse nine. I see this is only a few years after, not even a few years. Yeah, it is. It would be uh, by the time we get to Joshua, it'd be a number of years after the parting of the Red Sea. Yeah, it'd be a little over 40 years, because this is after the wilderness experience. 
and they're now coming into Israel from the east side of Jordan. All right, and they confront Rahab on the wall of Jericho. Jo uh, Joshua chapter 2, verse 9. And this is what Rahab, the Jerichoite, says to these Jewish spies. She said to the men, I know, see, I'm not going by hearsay. I know that the Lord has given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us and that all of the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. Now here it comes. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. Now listen, Jericho wasn't that far from Egypt. This wasn't something halfway around the world that they had picked up by hearsay and legend. No, this was front page news, if you want to put it that way, that here the God of Israel opened up the waters of the Red Sea and that nation of several million people walked through, not through the mud, but on dry land. It was an established fact in ancient history that this is what God did when he brought Israel up out of Egypt. So never doubt it. Not for a moment. This is not just some, some legend or some myth. This is actual historical fact. All right, Isaiah 63 once again. And so, even as he brought Israel out of Egypt, verse 12, reading it again, 63 verse 12, the God that led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name. The God that led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness. Now that's a play on words that the average reader will never get. Like I pointed out, I think, in our last taping, in the Middle East, what's the wilderness? Desert. And what's desert? Flat. I'll never forget our trip down to Petra. Remember that? Oh, just flat for miles and miles and miles. Well, for a horse and rider, what is that? Hey, that's smooth going. That's smooth going compared to through the rocks and canyons of a mountainous area. So this is the picture now. The horseman in the wilderness of the Middle East is riding without fear of stumbling or rocks or whatever like that. And so this is the God who led them as someone riding a horseback on a flat desert table. And then they would not stumble. But on the other hand, verse 14, we have another picture. In it says, a beast who goes down to the valley. Now, why do beasts go down into the valleys of a terrain? What's down there? Water. Water. See? And so these are the analogies you've got to look for. God brought them out just like a horseman riding on the desert, but he took care of them like animals going down to the cool water of a mountain stream. All right? And then the Spirit of the Lord caused him to rest. So did you lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. Now, this is really a prayer, you see, on behalf of this small little remnant who recognize who the God of Israel really is. Now, verse 15. Look down from heaven, and behold, from the habitation of thy holiness and of thy glory, where is thy zeal and thy strength, the sounding of thy innermost being and of thy mercies toward me? Are they restrained? Now verse 16. Here's an interesting statement again that the casual reader will just slip over. Doubtless thou art our father. Now did unbelieving Israel think that? Let me show you. Come back to John's Gospel. Now, I like to jump into the New Testament as often as I can because I don't want someone to accuse me of staying in the Old Testament. But come into John's Gospel. I think it's chapter 8. John's Gospel, chapter 8. Verse 39. Oh, got it? John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 39. The Pharisees now are confronting Jesus. And they're ridiculing him. They're scorning him. And they answered and said, in verse 39, 
And they said unto him, Abraham is our father. See? And so they, they really didn't understand God, the creator of everything, as their father. And they ridiculed Christ when he claimed to know the father and was the Father. I think I had a couple other verses on my mind, but that should suffice. They knew nothing of God as their father. They recognized Abraham as their father, and they were religious on that basis. But to have God as their father, they knew nothing of it. All right, verse 16 again, back in Isaiah 63. So, the believing element can claim God as father. Doubtless thou art our father, though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not. Now there again, what does that tell you? What did the rank and file of Israel, or how did the rank and file of Israel feel about the true believers? They detested them. They detested them. They're nothing but negatives. They're holding everything back. They're not progressive. Sound familiar? Yeah, it does. It's no different today. And so it's always been that the true believer was considered a stumbling block to progress, see? All right, reading on. But, O Lord, thou art our Father, our Redeemer. See, there's that word again, the one who purchased their salvation. Thy name is from everlasting. O Lord, why hast thou made us to err from thy ways and hardened our heart from thy fear? Return for thy servant's sake the tribes of thine inheritance. Now, you see, way back here, Isaiah is prophesying how the remnant at the end time that we looked at in the last half hour will be waiting for the return of Christ to establish his kingdom. And so they can pray, return, return. But... Did the unbelieving element want that? No, that's the last thing they wanted. In fact, this always brings up a question. Go back with me. I hope I don't get myself in trouble here. <laughs> I probably should look up where I was in Psalms. But anyway, go back with me to Acts. Go back to Acts. And... Uh, Chapter 7, Stephen. I had to quickly find my verse in Psalms, otherwise I'd have been in a jam, but I found it. Stephen, chapter 7. You all know the account. He had just finished his great dissertation condemning the nation of Israel. And then he come down to verse 54, Acts 7. I hope you're... Catching my analogy, this is going to be the attitude of the, the masses of Israel compared to that remnant that will be spared and are waiting for the Lord to return, much like the unbelieving element confronting Stephen. All right, verse 54, when they heard these things, that is from Stephen, they were cut to the heart, they gnashed on him with their teeth, but he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly in the heaven saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing. And all oh, that throws a curve at everybody. Why did Stephen see Jesus standing when all the rest of Scripture says he sat down at the right hand of the Father on high? Well, if he's going to return, what does he have to do from the seated position? Well, he has to stand. See? And was Israel ready for that at Stephen's day? No. Now flip back to Psalm 68, and this will show you why. Oh, they didn't want Christ to return. That's the last thing they wanted. But the remnant did. All right, Psalm 68. Got it? Psalm 68, verse 1. Psalm 68, verse 1. I still hear leaves turning, so I'll wait a minute. Psalms 68, verse 1. Look how plain language puts it. 
let God, what? Arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Why? Because when he st stands from that seat of position, he's going to come in judgment first before he brings in the blessings of the kingdom. And so let his enemies be scattered. Let him also that hate him flee from before him. Now, we showed that so graphically in our last set of four programs. My, when he returns, he's going to be as if stomping on the masses of humanity so that the blood is spattered on his raiment. And it was compared to what? The grapes in a grape vat. Remember? All of Scripture draws that analogy that he's going to return in wrath against his enemies, but it will be the greatest blessing on earth for the remnant of believing Israel who will be waiting for his coming. All right, just read through verse 2. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melteth before the fire, so let the wicked melt or perish at the presence of God. That is his second coming. And then verse 3, but what about the righteous? They're going to be glad. Let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. Sing unto God, sing praises to him, extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name Jehovah, and rejoice before him. Now that's the exuberance then of the remnant at the return of Christ. But the majority of Israel, no, they don't want him to return. They, are, they aren't ready for him. And so always remember these things, that the second coming will be wrath and vexation on the unbelieving world. But for that remnant of Israel, it's be the culmination of all the prophetic scriptures. All right, back to Isaiah. We've got a couple minutes left. Isaiah 63 again. <clears throat> Verse 17, the last part again, return for thy servant's sake. See, the believers wanted him to return. Now, don't forget the setting. These are the tribulation remnant that are waiting for his sudden, sudden return. All right? Return for thy servant's sake, the tribes of thine inheritance. So that's all the tribes of Israel will be involved. The people of thy holiness have possessed it but a little while. Our adversaries, now this, of course, is a reference to the Babylonians as well as the Romans. Our adversaries have trodden down thy sanctuary. I feel it's a reference to the temples. But the little remnant of Israel can claim we are thine. Why? Because of their faith, God has redeemed them, and they are a believing remnant. Thou never bearest rule over them, they, that as the adversaries, they were never called by thy name. And so it's so obvious now that this is the prayer and the expectation of the remnant. Now, I think we can go right on into 64 because, after all, these chapter breaks were not in the originals, and uh, it reads just as well without the chapter heading. So it's that same remnant that continues in this prayer of exaltation. Oh, that thou wouldst rend the heavens, that thou wouldst come down. See? Now, I think we did this in one of our last programs. Israel is waiting for Christ to come down. Now, turn to me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we'll see the opposite effect of you and I and the body of Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and this is what we have to do. A lot of people try to put everything into one basket. No, you don't ever do that. You just keep separating the scriptures. The Old Testament believers expected God to come down. He's going to stand on the Mount of Olives. He's going to set up his throne in Jerusalem. He's going to give them an earthly kingdom. But you and I, we're going the other direction. See? 1 Thessalonians 4. And I'm going to read them all again because every day we get letters of people who have just caught the program for the first time. You know, yesterday a lady called and she ordered something and I said, well, how long have you been listening? One program. It's unbelievable. See, one program. So we have to constantly keep them in mind as we repeat and repeat and repeat. All right, here's Paul's take on what the church or the true church, the body of Christ is looking for. 
shortly before Israel looks for him to come down into their midst. Now, it's the same way with the two Jewish ladies grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Well, that's not the rapture. The one taken in that case is the unbeliever. They're going to be removed from the scene, and the believer will be left. But for the church age believer, it's just the opposite. All right, starting in verse 13, 1 Thessalonians 4, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them who are asleep, who have physically died, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in other words, we believe Paul's gospel, even so them also who have died in Jesus, God will bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. See how plain that is? Now Israel would say the coming of the Lord is down to them. He's going to come to the Mount of Olives. Zechariah says it. Acts 1 says it. He's going to stand on the Mount of Olives when he comes. But for us, he's not going to come to the planet. He's going to come to the air. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord shall not precede or go ahead of them who have died. And this is the reason. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we who are alive and remain, we're still in our everyday livelihood, will suddenly be what? Caught up. He's not going to be brought down to our midst. We're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds, to meet him in the air, and then so shall we ever be with the Lord. Well, that's the beginning of eternity for us. For Israel, it's the beginning of the kingdom here on earth. A thousand years of glorious rule and reign by their king, their Messiah, their Redeemer. But for us, it's already the beginning of the eternal state. And we're getting closer and closer every day. And how we long for, as Paul puts it, to escape this old tabernacle of the flesh with all of its disappointments and its pain and its suffering. And one day we're going to have that glorious body like his resurrected body. And not just for the thousand years, but for all eternity. But Israel, Israel is looking for the Messiah to come down from heaven into their midst and to set up the promised kingdom. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.